Greetings and salutations. Hello and welcome to On the Phone with Josh, your weekly guide to thinking and living like Jesus. This is our NPR episode. And we are excited to say, I can't keep doing it. <laughs> oh, how are you doing today? Uh, you know, I am happy to be recording. Uh, it was a long and hard weekend. And yeah, I'm glad to be through the weekend. It was hard stuff, but good stuff. And now here we are. And man, recording with you is just one of the highlights of my week. Oh, man. Which is why every time I look in the mirror, it is one of the highlights of my week. I <laughs> just love being with me, just like you do. Yeah, this you are the Josh in On the Phone with Josh. Like, it, this really just centers around you. <laughs> Most things do. <laughs> wow, um, we're getting off to a good start. Yep. Uh, especially considering what I want to talk about today. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, please. Let's talk about what you would like to talk about. Ooh, that's right. Yes, it is all about me. <laughs> but but seriously, uh, there is an irony here that I did not build in on purpose. Oh, boy. But we have been talking about the Psalms for two summers now. And we are more than halfway through our second summer. Yeah. We have read... 250 psalms out of the 150. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. And yet, and this is where it gets a little weird to me, somehow we have not had a full conversation about the idea of praise. Hmm. And I, I want to have this conversation for two reasons. First of all, I did some quick Highly academic Google searching and <laughs> not chat GPT only, you know, I would have actually, if I'd thought of it because <laughs> chat GPT probably, I wish I could pull it up really quick because it probably would be more accurate. Um, all right. Well, since you mentioned chat GPT, I had to pause the episode to go ask chat GPT because it was more accurate than a Google search any day of the week, <laughs> but chat GPT that highly academic source of all knowledge <laughs> tells us that the command to praise is given to us at least 200 times in the book of Psalms. Hmm. Can you think of any other command in the Bible that we get 200 times? Well, or that it seems like we might get 200 times? But you're saying you're expanding it just to the the Bible, right? This is yeah. 200 times in the book of Psalms. So 200 yeah. times in one book is the metric. And A fair point. And no, no, I cannot think of anything <laughs> that right? highly weighted. So if this is that highly weighted, it seems to me, if I take following Jesus seriously, I should put a lot of work into this. And I don't. Yeah. Well, and so here's where I get all tripped up right out of the gate, because I think we have a muddled definition of what praise means. I wouldn't be able to accurately define it unless what I've heard is correct. So I have heard praise be distinguished from worship in that praise is speaking about God to others, and worship is worshiping God in his character. It's, it's God-directed, and that the two words are distinguished in that way. What do you make of that? Do you think that's true? Hmm. I would have said worship is a broader category, which I guess I would summarize as celebrating God. So this could be who God is or what God has done. This could be directly to God or not directly to God. So that would have been my summary. Worship is celebrating God. One subset of that would have been celebrating who God is. And I think that's what I would have described praise as. So 
God gave me this awesome house, and here's how. That would be worship, but not praise. God is kind and generous. That would be worship and praise. I think that's how I would have. I'm not saying that's right, by the way. Like, that's just kind of my natural starting point. Sure. And see, this is where, like, I, again, we're just, we're struggling with a definition, let alone how to carry it out. And so yeah. when the Psalms command this, say, 200 times, I don't even know how to follow the command because I'm not exactly sure what it's telling me to do. So this is where you'll be very glad I consulted ChatGPT. <laughs> okay. Yay, ChatGPT, solving all, solving all of our theological issues. It really is fascinating. But the primary word, halal, that is used to command praise in the Psalms also means to boast. And I think that does begin to give us some clarity on what the word means. If I am talking about my wife to you, and I say, boy, my wife is incredibly hardworking and intelligent and empathic and kind and thoughtful. I am boasting about my wife. Yeah. And I think it's still boasting about my wife if I say to my wife, wow, you are kind and thoughtful and hardworking and incredible. And I, I think that's still boasting about my wife. I think it is just, man, my wife is awesome. I think what's interesting is, at least for me, a boast has an intellectual component and a heart component. Yeah, but here's where I actually kind of like the distinction between praise as being communicated to others and worship being communicated to God. Or maybe I would even put adoration being communicated toward God. Praise directed toward others really reminds me of this concept of witness that we have been talking about offline because we we're doing our revelation study concurrent with our summer in the Psalms. And so much of revelation talks about the church's role in witness. And I think one way that the church witnesses concerning God is this act of praise, this act of boasting to others about how great God is. And I think that is an important element, even if you know we decide that that's not quite the full definition of praise. I think it's absolutely a crucial element to praise, which is this telling others how great he is. I think this is a great point. I think witness has to be a part of praise. So let's hang out here for a second. And let me ask you, how do you do this in a way that doesn't make you weird? <laughs> or offensive to your audience, or just annoying? Well, to be honest, it's the same way the Bible does it. It tells stories over and over and over again. And even in the Psalms, when it's commanding you to praise God, it is almost always connected with a story about God, whether it's a well-known story from other parts of the Bible or it's a personal story of how God delivered me, or God delivered us, or God showed up in this way, or God will show up in this way. It's all connected to story. And I think if we can tell the deeds of God in story form, we can expose the character of God and boast in his goodness through story. I like this distinction that you're making that I think is incredibly valuable. It's telling the historic deeds of God and the personal deeds of God. I just think that's a valuable distinction. And you're right. The Psalms do a lot of both. God delivered me from the mire, and God delivered the people of Israel by splitting the Red Sea and bringing them through the desert and giving them quail when they were whiny and all of those things. Hmm. So... I find myself asking, why do I, to what degree do I do this? Like, this is where I, I pull out the old tool of, on a scale of one to 10, how much am I actually doing this? Hmm. And 
what would it look like to take a step forward? What are the barriers there? Because I feel like, I guess I feel like for me, the times people do this, it somehow feels like it becomes thoughtless. Hmm. Like, you know, it's the person who thanks God because they had a craving for chicken noodle soup and they had one can of chicken noodle soup left. <laughs> and God really took care of me today by making sure I had that one. Can. No, you just had an extra can of chicken noodle soup. For the soul. Um, yes, for the stinking soul. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, I hear it in things like the absent minded or habituated response praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people mean that genuinely. So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing mm -hmm. to do, but I think that there no, are, not at all. there are times where people have become habituated to that. And there isn't a lot of actual praise left in that statement. Yeah. I think habituated is exactly what I'm trying to get at. I think that's one thing that turns me off on this. And the other is, I find it difficult to know in my own personal life when I can say God did this and when I'm, I can't. Hmm. So therefore it is hard to praise God when I don't know how to identify in a way that I am comfortable with in a non-subjective light. What is the activity of God in my life? I think that might be true, but at the same time that that is true, I don't think you have any problem identifying the work of God as revealed through scripture. I think hundred percent you to, in my life, you have been one of the strongest influences in pulling me back to the work of God as revealed in scripture. And you constantly bring me back to Yes, but what does this say about what God is doing? Yes, it commands me to do X, Y, or Z, but what does it say about God? And that is a constant refrain from you. And I feel like as much as you you know, say you, you struggle with identifying God's work in your own life versus your own actions or whatever, um, or just happenstance, like you happen to have a cup of soup, but you do an amazing job of the other side. Well, thank you. Um, that's... Great to know. Um, <laughs> I, I Awkward moment. Honored. No, exactly. It's because it is something that I clearly think is important, hence the reason I'm bringing it up today. It is delightful to know that maybe I'm better at it than I think. Um, and so I'm paused now thinking, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I find myself asking on the personal side still, what does it mean to identify the work of God in my life, to see his fingerprints in my life and not be goofy about it? Yeah. Honestly, this resonates so much with the things that we talk about on this podcast. I think you have to have a community. And I think mm -hmm. our little awkward moment there just highlighted that. How can you recognize God's work in your life? Well, your best friend just told you. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when somebody says it and you can see it, you go, oh, yeah, no, that is a way God has really worked in my life and developed me. And, you know, I, I, I show a lot of redemption in that area of my life. Huh. That's fantastic. Um, I, I do think it takes a community. And I have had this experience as well, where you know, I, I lay out this whole series of events. I tell my story and then somebody has to come along and say, yeah, did you notice what God did in that story? No, please tell me. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how somebody can see God's actions in my life or in my story or in the events of my life that I couldn't see for myself. I think the other piece of it, I think a listening community is a huge part of this. And by the way, Part of that for me then becomes an ongoing community, not a community that's known me for two years, but a community of people who've known me for as long as possible. And so yeah. this is where I think when relationships get complicated 
and the 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 instinct to cut and run what is at stake is the listening community that has known you long enough to be able to wisely see and and discern themes right right and i mean i i want to speak to two issues one is that not every community is created equal right mm -hmm. you're assuming a level of maturity and wisdom and sensitivity within a long-standing community that isn't always there. And so let's just be honest about that. It, mm -hmm. And and I think just the fact that some people are without a long-standing community for whatever reason. And I want to provide hope to say that community can be formed and developed. And uh, sure, it takes time. But, uh, you know, even early on in a forming of a listening community, there's great value early on. I mean, I've, I've had people that have known me a relatively short amount of time call out things that they see in me, and it's wildly encouraging. And I'm like, wow, I, we've met and talked how many times, and, and you feel that you can see that in me? Wow. Okay. Yeah, I think you're exactly right here. I think, first of all, to your point that not all communities are created equal, what really matters is, is this community able to inspire me forward? Mm. And in part, that depends as much on me as it does on the community. Am I going in judgmentally or am I going in looking to see what I can gain from this community? Sure. And then also to your point, I think because of that, awkwardness at the beginning is okay and right like you said it's it's it just happens it it's messy getting into community yeah but i think it is the messy moments that ultimately yield the fruit of the benefits later you have to do, go through the awkward process of getting to know people or you don't ultimately know them mm. does that make sense mm -hmm. like it's almost syllogistic but i still know things about you because our first experiences were working together in a cafeteria. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, and part of my base knowledge of you were those moments, as well as the base moment of me walking up to you and saying, for all intents and purposes, let's be serious friends. What do you think? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. That was a weird thing to do. But it told me a ton about you that you were responsive to that. Well, and it, yeah, and it told me a ton about you and what you wanted out of a friendship. Like it set the tone pretty early on for like, no, we're not just going to like hang out and go for a run every Saturday. Let's genuinely get to know one another and spur each other forward. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think there's this idea of community. I also think another way of seeing what God is doing comes down to, and I'm realizing this, reflecting on what I think I hear. I think it comes down to having a continually reforming framework for what God is doing in the world. Hmm. If I think God is actively at work providing for me, and that is my primary thing, I am going to see God's provision in the can of soup. And that may or may not be true. I'm not, not really interested in analyzing that at this moment. If I see God's work in the world as sanctifying his people, I am going to see God's work in the world in the way that he has formed me as a person to be a praiser or not or whatever. Yeah. But I think it's going to be the, the bumpers that guard my interpreting of the world are my theological beliefs about what God is doing. Right. Well, and I think that's where the Psalms are so incredibly helpful. Yes, there's this command mm. to praise, but the Psalms themselves describe God's work in the world. In fact, a few of these Psalms, like I'm thinking about a, a particular Psalm, I can't remember, but I know it was one by the, the sons of Korah, and they sit down and they rehash 
like, God, you did this. This is the way you showed up for our ancestors. You did this and this and this, and you came to their rescue. And God, now come and do it again. It's an acknowledgement of this is how you operate. We've seen it time and time and time again. And now I want to see it in my day and in my time. And so you start recognizing patterns of God's behavior by immersing yourself in the stories and the testimonies of Scripture so that you can see it play out in your own day and time. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think this actually really unifies the two ways of seeing God personally at work and seeing God historically at work. This unifies the two. The historical seeing God at work gives us the form that we then fill with our and interpret our own experiences in and through. Yeah. The, yeah. It's the pattern and we see the pattern play out and we're like, Oh, I recognize this. I've seen this before. Yeah. It's reverse typology almost, Mm. but yeah, it's patterns. I think that's just a great way to think of it. It's just patterns. And then what does this look like practically? That's my other question. So I'm in a conversation I mean, let's take three kind of simple conversations. I'm in a conversation with you. I'm in a conversation with the checkout person at a grocery store, though I avoid checkout people at grocery stores like the plague <laughs> uh, because I would vastly prefer automatic checkout. Yeah, but, right. but uh, and then let's just t- take a casual acquaintance at work. So you've kind of got three different relationships. Does it matter? who you're talking to, because I would generally argue communication is a two-person endeavor, so you need to take your audience into account whenever you're talking, or you shouldn't be talking. So what? how does praise need to change based on those three categories? So I actually see one singular rule governing all three scenarios. Mm. And for me... In order for those conversations to not be awkward, they they can't... Which is very important to me, to be quite frank. Absolutely. That is what I'm going for. Well, and me too. Me too. Here's the thing. It just, it has to be genuine. Mm -hmm. It has to be a part of you, right? I have to be steeped in the things of God, whether that's the people of God or the word of God. I need to be steeped in that such that... I am recognizing God's actions in the world, both past and present, and it bubbles out of me, right? I, there's a guy, so years ago, I had a mentor through the city at which I work, and he was supposed to be a business mentor, but it, it so happens that he was also a Christian that was deeply in love with God's beauty. And he had challenged himself many years before to see an element of God's beauty every single day. And because he was so steeped in that, it naturally came out. He was an avid runner and marathoner, and he often talked about the beauty that he saw while he was training or running or whatever. It just flowed out of him. And it was never awkward because it was, it was so incredibly him. He knew God's beauty and he talked about it a lot. And so it's not that every conversation was like, hey, do you know how I saw beauty today? Right? In some awkward, like forced way. It just came up. Man, I love that. I think that's really important. The focus on growth in this area is not in forcing myself to talk about it, but in training myself to see it and then removing any barriers I might have to talking about it, but not in a way that I'm like, oh, I got to talk about it in this conversation, just in a way that's, let me work through any, like we are in this conversation, any kind of barriers. But I think you're right. Otherwise, it's just a matter of cultivating seeing it, not cultivating talking about it, because talking about it comes naturally. Or it can, right? Yeah. I think one element that I see in the Psalms, the fact that it's commanded 200 times tells me we all have a little growth to do here and that it's mm-hmm. it's a reminder that we all need to not just recognize God's work in the world, but to speak up about it. 
And so I don't know what everybody's barriers are, but it sure seems like a universal tendency to have barriers of some sort. And, you know, again, going back to our Revelation study that we're getting ready to release, one of the primary goals of the book of Revelation is to see the centrality of God to the nature of the universe. God is at the center. Yes. If that is just true about the universe, it seems to me that praise becomes a natural outgrowth of living on the periphery, which all of us do, right? We all live on the periphery of the universe. Only God is at the center. But we have to reorient, right? If we're living out the periphery, there's only a small field of our vision that incorporates God. We can turn our vision at 360 degrees, and only some of that is focused on God. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what the Psalms and what good community does is reorient us back to the center of the universe. I, Mm. I, so my daughter and I kind of talked about this the other day. This is so cool. I, I hope you listen to this, Jason. Uh, Jason is our worship leader at church, and Jason has this amazing moment that he does as he's leading worship. He's dancing on stage and just like really engaged in worship, and he steps back from the microphone, and he has this woo. And it is so, it's like the most powerful amen you've ever heard. Mm. And both my daughter and I find that to be so orienting. I almost think of it like, like going to a chiropractor and he's got you all positioned. He's got you relaxed. And then that woo is the chiropractor just snapping your back right back into place. Just I am fully aligned. And being in community with Jason helps me be realigned to the center of the universe. And if I can be there, I can praise. I can tell people how good God is. Ooh, wouldn't you love to have somebody say that about you? <laughs> yeah, right? I know. Nobody listens to our podcast and says, Ooh, I am fully realigned. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But that is a huge compliment and I think amazing. And I think you're absolutely right. When you're around people who are aligned in that way, it realigns you, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I tell you what, this has been super encouraging. I want to grow in the area of praise, but I, I want to take one step back from that and say, I want to grow in my focus on the center of the throne so that I can praise. Mm, absolutely. I think that's really good. Well, hey, that's that's what I've been kind of wondering about, but I would love to turn this ar- around to the audience and just say, what inspires you to praise? What about God? What moments in your life recently? Uh, you know, we would love to hear stories about how God has been at work in your life. We'd love to hear stories about what things God has done in Scripture that really captivate you and excite you. We would just love to hear from you things about God that you want to praise. And we'd also invite you to use this episode as a way to start a conversation with a friend. What are some things about God that really have caught your attention lately? How has God been at work in your life? Yeah. We hope that this will give you space to praise more in your life. Yes. Any comments left? to that effect, or any conversations had with a friend to that effect, is an act of praise. So how cool. Well, all right. I want to turn it over to you, Josh from Missouri. Since this is our Summer in the Psalms series, we don't often get to talk about thoughts outside of the Psalms. So I'd like to know what else you've been thinking about. You know, this is a kind of half-baked sort of thought, but Recently, uh, as a matter of fact, I mentioned it on the podcast a while back, I applied for a job. Uh, It's a job that I ended up not getting, and Mm. I was really excited about it. Yeah, which is tough because it was a job I really was super, super excited about. And I had this moment 
early on when I was applying for it, when I could have said, I feel like God is telling me I'm going to get this job. And I was very hesitant to use that language, apparently appropriately so, but it just has me thinking about the fact that when we use strong language in certain circumstances, like God told me, we are driving a stake in the ground that we then have to stand by and reinforce no matter what happens. Hmm. And if we hold things a little bit more loosely, I didn't know if God was telling me. And this was a great opportunity for me to refine my learning about when God is speaking. Because if God had been speaking to me, then I would have gotten it right. God isn't wrong ever, but it's okay. Uh, I'm learning in this process. And I guess this is what strikes me is it is a neat moment to refine what it means to hear from God. And that's important. And that's my whole thought. It's a good thought. I, I, I can't help but think about Paul and Paul's letter to the Romans. He wrote the book of Romans. He wrote the letter to the Roman church simply and solely because he needed Rome's help to get to Spain. And he believed God had called him to go to Spain and preach the gospel there. And most scholars believe he never made it to Spain. Hmm. And so maybe God called him to Spain so that he would write the letter of Romans and hmm. bless the church for thousands of years thereafter. And so, I mean, at the same time that you're holding things loosely, I also want to contextualize what it means to hold things loosely and to say, Maybe I did hear from God on this, but it looks different than I expected. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Yeah. And this is exactly what refining means, right? Like is knowing after 30 years of following Jesus, I have a lot to learn about following Jesus right. in practical everyday life. And that's okay because the journey will always bring me back to humility if I'm following God. Yeah. Yeah. So good. But, but what about you? What have you been thinking about? Yeah, well, I had a really cool experience on Sunday morning. Um, yes, Jason did a woo, but uh, that was not what I, I was, was going to say. You had two cool experiences on Sunday right. morning. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, no, this was actually as a result of being on the sermon prep team. So most of the time, sermon prep team is dedicated to going over the text and uh, making sure we understand the text and then you know, talking a little bit about how to structure a sermon around that. And then that's that's it. And then the, the person preaching takes that information, adds it to their own study, and crafts a sermon. And there you go. But occasionally, when we have somebody preaching that has not done so very often, uh, they will use sermon prep time to do a practice run-through of their sermon. Hmm. And then the rest of the sermon prep team gives feedback on you know, on the sermon, on the delivery, on whatever. And it, it's a little bit... Ooh, that was horrible. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so it's it's a little like drinking from a fire hose from the, uh, I would presume, from the speaker's perspective, because boy, that's just a lot of feedback coming in. But it was so cool this week to go to Sermon Prep Team on Tuesday, see the run through, hear all of the feedback that was given, and see the way that that feedback was incorporated into the final product and then preached on Sunday morning. And there are people on the sermon prep team who are immensely gifted at communicating and breaking a, a speech, a sermon, whatever, into organized thoughts, but with unifying themes. And some of the feedback given was, was so crucial to breaking this up into more bite-sized pieces, but holding together some unifying themes at the same time. And then, you know, the senior pastor's response to the preacher to say, you have a lot of authority in this church. You have a perspective from which to speak, and, and it's good to lean into that. And on down the line, all of these great moments of feedback and the way that it showed up on Sunday morning to make the sermon even better. Like 
you know, the, the original comment from our senior pastor after the person preached on Tuesday was, if you'd have just done that, you'd be fine. Like, that's great all in of, all in of itself. And it was. It was, it was great. And then it was even better by Sunday. And so it was just a really fun experience to watch that feedback just pay off in some really cool ways. It's amazing. Yeah. This resonates a ton with me. Whenever I get to talk to somebody about their sermon, I end up enjoying their sermon more. Oh, for sure. I've always felt like pastors would do well to do a like cutting room floor social media post where they just kind of blurb about what they didn't get into their sermon. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's so often the things that I just will find the most interesting. But anyway, nobody's ever listened to me. It's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> but well, are you ready once again to end on a low note? All right. Let's bring it down. Are we going back to NPR levels? Oh, and now as we wrap things up here on the easy listening station. Okay. This is painful. <laughs> uh, which Josh has the same middle name as both his father and his son. And that's me. My dad's middle name is Stephen. My, my middle name is Stephen. My son's middle name is Stephen. Um, as a matter of fact, when my wife got pregnant and we called my parents and, and we told them uh, that we had picked out a name, my dad, you know, we said it, whatever. My dad was like, wait, what did you say the middle name was? He didn't even care about the first name. <laughs> All he cared about was the fact that the middle name was going to stay the middle name, the family middle name, uh, which, by the way, this is a great way to have a family tradition that is non-intrusive. Mm. It's very easy to keep a middle name tradition alive. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, you don't have so, to say the third or the fourth or whatever. Yeah, no, it's not. It's just not obnoxious or intrusive. It's just there. We all know it's there. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. I, I love the fact that this is the way my family does this. But I also love the fact that when I was telling my father my son's name, he didn't care about the first name. He really only cared about the, the middle name. Uh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. so my wife, when, when we got married, she had always dreamt of naming her firstborn son, John, which was her dad's name. And her dad passed away when she was young. And then she married me and that became impossible because my last name is Jacobson and John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt was just too much of a thing. <laughs> so we had to take the middle that name gone approach. Somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So middle names, you can just tuck that in there and nobody ever knows. That's brilliant. Yep. I love it. Well, hey, we on for next week? We are on for next week. I'm looking forward to it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, bye. What? All right, bye.